Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team Podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. Your hosts today are me, I'm Jason. And I'm Travis, regular co-hosts. We connect with all sorts of different people, TOs, uh, competitive players, and just um, anyone else that has something interesting to say that they message us and convince us to talk about on an episode. Yeah, we do like making the world a little bit smaller, one hobbyist at a time. We do have a Discord and a Patreon, which is definitely some stuff that you should check out if you enjoy our content. And if you do enjoy this podcast, make sure to share it with your friends who play Kill Team, because the more the merrier. In today's episode, we interview my friend Ted from the local Minnesota scene, talking about his fresh take on Hyrule Attack Circle, mainly with the Psychomancer. Nice, nice to make your acquaintance, Ted. Yeah, nice to meet you, Rose. The Psychomancer himself. <laughs> Psycho meta out here I, my, in my, Minnesota. My tournament win rate on the Psychomancer is not as good as the Chronomancer, but I've only played two tournament games with the Chronomancer. <laughs> So, what's your tournament win rate with the Chronomancer versus the Psychomancer? 100% win rate on Chrono, but that's out of only two games. Uh, Psychomancer is at 80% win rate. And that's, oh, all of my, that's all of my other tournament games. What is that like? It's got to be like in the a dozen or more? 30? Uh, I don't know. Uh, probably either way, like, that's pretty solid. Probably something like, like 15 it. games or something like that. 18. And these are all at, anyways, you know, smaller tournaments or local yeah, tournaments? Yeah, I mean, the largest tournament I've been able to play in was the Renegade. I, I really wanted to do... Um, Adepticon. Adepticon, but it was my kid's second birthday that weekend. Definitely not one of those times to go <laughs> in. So Fair enough. My wife is like, oh, you could go. I'm like, no, you say that two months ahead of time, and then we're going to get to the weekend, though. And you would be like, no, you're not going to go anywhere. All right, so, you know, for anyone who's listening... Uh, this is Ted, a local psychomancer extraordinaire, because there's literally nothing we like doing more on this podcast than talking about Phobos and Higher Tech Circle. I thought you were going to say Higher Tech Circle, and I was like, hold on. <laughs> uh, Legionaries are pretty up there, too, but we've kind of we, yeah. they've taken a little bit of a backseat lately. They have. They have. Just because, like, you know, the new hotness is Night Lords, and I'm sure we'll get around to talking about Night Lords soon enough, but listeners just heard that last podcast, so now we're back to talking about the other top king of the meta, which is Higher Tech Circle. S-tier. And instead of talking about the same thing that everyone else wants to talk about, we're talking about the Psychomancer with Ted here. So fresh. Because Ted, you've been crushing the Midwest locally. You know, funny, tiny, funny little anecdote. In our Discord... You mentioned that like you and Shane had done well with them, and then Shane on the side messaged me like, "Who? Who's Ted?" I was like, "Well, Ted <laughs> locally, he's a big he's a big deal <laughs> locally." I'm a I'm a large fish in a in a moderate sized pond that has not jumped right. into the ocean yet. Yeah, I think um, it was just cute because Shane was like, "I have never heard of a Psychomancer player before." I was like, oh, "Don't worry, Shane. <laughs> he's a he's a big deal locally, and you know, a yeah. big part of a uh, big part of the Midwest, at least in Jason's community, right?" I went I went undefeated at uh, the Paul Bunyork World Championship Invitational, the second one, um, which was a three round eight person tournament. And this is pre buff. No, that one was actually last weekend. Oh. Okay, so, all right. So the new the new psychomancer the, the who new, can injure the new people. Psychomancer with the, the APL and injure is really mean. Um, I actually was able to drop that like a fusion pistol harlequin and just be like, yeah, you get to sit there and and not do anything. Um, I guess you know for listeners who don't know, you want to talk through from top to bottom what the psychomancer does on all of its, all of its abilities and kind of talk about how you find uses for each one because I'm sure most players haven't really played against higher tech circle. And they know of, you know, at this point, the cheese from Chronomancer. You know, you'll walk up, drop yeah. a bubble of uh, counter temporal nanomine, slow people down, and then just nuke someone else by letting your Despotech or something else run up the board. But the Psychomancer mm-hmm. is an untapped vein. You know, we've talked a little bit about the Technomancer on the podcast, but Psychomancer, we haven't really talked much about. Maybe because we've been planning to have you on at some point or another. <laughs> or at least Jason's been in the background scheming for this podcast. Mm-hmm. That's true. Ted's been crushing people with the Psychomancer for a long time. Like, even before, like, higher tech were quote-unquote good. He's just, like, rolling around just, like, alpha bombing everybody and uh, giving people the hotness. That, that, uh, uh, the, the Psychomancer's gun is, is one that you go through the stats of and people just look at you like, what, what insanity is this until you get to the damage profile. 
because it's it's like the chronomancer's aeon stave the uh the abyssal staff it's um five attacks on threes uh two two which the damage profile you're like okay it's a it's a flamer but then it's blast splash one and ap2 um so it's very reliably putting putting damage on pretty much anything that doesn't have a, a solid invuln save yeah, that um, what does it end up like four to eight damage on like pretty much mostly anything pretty much anything yeah i dumped seven damage into custodes last week with it and it was just like well you're you have one save to stop this but that's uh four hits in a crit after um going through arcane conduit for that uh ambush re- cult ambush reroll um which is and the the apprentice being that apl3 so you can actually get the the arc through a lot easier with a good positioning is really bit nice um but the, the gun is solid it's if it if it if it rolls hot and you get a couple extra crits in there um even like intercessors start to get concerned about getting hit by that. I've had a couple times where I've hit a couple legionaries or a couple intercessors, and they take like eight or nine wounds. And the the Astartes players are sitting there like, "What did what did you just do to me with the with like a two two blast weapon?" Um, the the and, other you know uh, it goes without saying that on in the dark specifically the five attacks on threes two two splash one profile is going to do a lot more heavy lifting because it's going to do way more crits which incur more attrition damage across the board yeah the lethal five up helps that a lot um the the, my problem with into the dark on it is it's much more difficult to get the um the reroll from your arcane conduit because it's so hard to draw visibility between the apprentech and the cryptech after like round turning point one you can usually line up some cheeky shots like tp1 that they can kind of shoot across your deployment zone but then you need to get those models up into the field and doing stuff yeah okay so the gun is a great piece of chip damage against pretty much all the teams really threatening mm-hmm. anyone that clumps up and against the bigger guys you know you've got the toughness to take a couple shots back so even if you're just doing a little bit of chip if you pull an intercessor out into the open for them to take a shot that's actually not the worst deal because you've got 13 wounds and you can get up once and yeah. nowadays with two up res it's basically get up for sure compared to before oh, man, i'm so torn on the two up like it's obviously very good for my team Right, and I've been playing Hero Tech exclusively um, competitively since I since I started rolling. Other than like the narrative event at Renegade, I played Blooded, um, and then had a bunch of guys like blown out to space. But yeah, other than that, um, just Hero Tech. The um, but like even without the the five up feel no pain, thirteen wounds with a three up save and a four up involve is is pretty beefy. That takes a lot of hits. Um, a lot of people also forget that Hero Tech have a tack ploy that they can bodyguard with one of with any other model in the team within two. So unless it's a blast weapon, like I've had a couple times where someone's like, "I'm going to put my," it's like nearly ending end of the turning point. I'm going to have my plasma gunner and my like Kasserkin team or my vet guard team pop out, and I'm going to plasma gun your leader. And I'm like, "Okay, uh, I'm going to have this Mook Immortal take that shot and just die for me." Um, and then yeah, and then stand up later. But it's you know, especially when you're like, oh, you dropped uh, Robin Ransack. I know you're going for headhunter, so I'm just going to completely deny you that shot. Um, which and since it's a tactical ploy, it's kind of in your back pocket that they don't always think about it. Where if you know you're like, oh, that guy has a like a bodyguard ability in some other teams, it's a little more like they see it a little more common. I, I found um, the other abilities on the, on the psychomancer though, you get um, conjure trauma, which is the one that you just point at someone visible. It's not line of sight. Like you just need to see like a, a clip of a, of a cape out sticking outside behind heavy cover and you can just drop injury on somebody. Um, so it just makes them injured no matter what, no injury rules that you know you get this like revolving door of oh it can't be injured now you can be injured even though you're not immune to injured that every gw game eventually gets um and then but and then they just added that on uh you you roll a die and if you roll over their apl value they take an apl debuff and um that has a lot of potential that if you can get any line on like a key key model of theirs especially if it's something 
that has to be close in. Uh, a melt a gunner, really does. fusion pistol, a grenade, a grenade. Um, you can just say no. Like, yeah, you're, you're useless for a turning point. That was that's like my whole plan with scouts. I've noodled around with scouts a little bit. It's just like on turn mm. one, give the key thing minus one APL, and it gives you like a whole turn of fearlessness if you use it right. So like <clears throat> the same concept of like using that to like conjure trauma on someone. I mean, I'm like coming from an alpha strike perspective. I'm like, just yeet them out there, blast somebody conjure trauma on like somebody else. So they can't like strike you back that well and just yep. like go nuts. Or even like, if you can get a really nice, uh, a turning, turning point two is more likely, but you know, you steal an APL from someone else. So you got your four, 4.5 APL turbo turn, um, you know, fly up on a, on a vantage blast somebody traumatize someone else and then dash off behind heavy cover if uh, you're on like Terius or something and just be like yep yeah, that's nice um now you have to like run around the entire board to get get a beat on me yeah the the the, the, the cryptics are all super rude um the other the other ones um the other abilities yeah conjure trauma is often really nice i usually primarily lose that use that against shooting teams um or like elite hordes the um, oh man, I hit a Custodes with that the other day, and they were so sad. Like, my Custodes is actually injured. Like, yep, you can just sit there with your sword and your shield and can't get to anything. Um, and you hit on threes now. Ooh, scary. Direct nerds. Going from twos <laughs> yeah. to threes, honestly, is like the biggest scale change in the game. It's, it's a bad jump. Um, the So the other main one that I, I like to use against uh, melee hordes, uh, anyone that's going to be coming into melee with you and on Into the Dark is Nightmare Shroud. And Nightmare Shroud is a six-inch bubble around the caster, and it's usually something I use it on the Cryptic, but I run it on the Apprentic pretty often as well, because the Apprentic, I don't care if I just bomb them into the middle of the enemy line and pop this six-inch bubble around a 32-millimeter base, which is even bigger than, um, say, like your... Uh, what was this... It's, pretty, it's a large it's a substantial it's a area, area. Yeah. six inches um, around a 32 millimeter base is getting to the position of like 40k uh objective markers which you know for kill team players who've looked over at 40k boards or age of sigmar boards they've got much really big pieces of terrain covered up by these objective markers and that's why the counter temporal nanomine was so abusive because it was a six yeah. inch bubble which is effectively you know 12 inches in diameter which is just massive so nightmare shroud is something very similar turns off re-rolls for attack dice which and you cannot retain uh crits at all yeah you know it's just like a flat out you know your shooting attacks and melee attacks are that much worse and considering that some of these newer teams that we've talked about the night lords and the exaction squad part of the reason why the teams are exaction squad is playable at all is because it turns off re-rolls Nightmare Shroud on an Apprentech that can still be the originating point for your Cryptex magnification conduit, which allows you to shoot through it, means that you can cover this huge area where your opponent is now just suffering. Which yeah. I guess is kind of the whole the whole goal for a Sekomancer, right? Yeah, it's 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 about you having a mental breakdown and me studying you while you you know completely uh, come to terms with your mortality. The um, but yeah, Nightmare Shroud is really, really solid against any melee team, especially, I actually really like it against uh, the Eldar teams, because Eldar just love dumping a pile of crits on you. And if you can turn that off, all of a sudden, all those shuriken weapons, all of their, like, power swords that they have everywhere, just stop. You need three hits on a normal immortal to kill them with a power weapon if it's not critting. And so if you turn off that lethal five up for those da six damage uh, crits, they, they get a real real hard time actually yeah uh, pumping that through. yeah it's like tilting shields times 10 like people honestly do not like r realize like everyone takes it for granted how big of like i mean no one understands how much like turning off crits is like actually pretty enormous or, like that um, really really can swing a whole turn very dramatically yeah and or even like just like a melt -a gun oh hey you can't drop mortal wounds into me i can block anything you shoot at me granted i only get my you know one one save but if it's on the psycho you it's got your four pinball save. they can't crit anymore your ap2 doesn't matter so you're basically just like okay i yeah, bring your melt gun in um i'm probably just gonna live and then heal and then you know annihilate your plat your melt gun um one of my 
one of my favorite moments with that is in on Into the Dark, you can set up positions where you get like a barricade where they have to be within six inches of you um, to attack you, right? And so I had like a, a Doom Bolter sergeant, Intercessor sergeant move in. I'm like, okay, uh, you can come into this room and shoot this guy. There is no way for you to mathematically be more than six inches away from me. So I see you have tactical blocker in and your lethal five up turbo bolt gun. Okay. If you don't get P1, doing you know you're doing four damage a hit, so that's that's gonna mess mess up a bit. But I think Nightmare Shroud is the kind of uh, the sleeper of the team, though, because right. everyone looks at Harbinger of Despair, um, which is the the third ability, and Harbinger of Despair is again a visibility point at a spot on the map, and your opponent counts as one APL less for contesting. It takes an extra APL for any mission actions. Um, that one I like into any like any team that doesn't have three APL base because you're you could put that on like not their home objectives necessarily but, but like the the closer ones on their side and you could point to that and say hey um, you got to use your comms guy to not go four and two this round because like I, if it's on open, I'm dropping a death a death mark on your other one of your other closer closer objectives. Then I'm gonna drop this on one of the one of your three. So I'm gonna steal one of your three, um, lock down another one, and then two. I've pretty often with the psychomancer, I'll go four and one on on primaries, especially on like loot or secure turning point one. All right, and that's just because a lot of teams are set up to do just a normal move and then an action to go pick up the point. So if you're able to do Harbinger of Despair, it turns off basically not the easy ones, but the secondary ones or even the far midboard ones. It just turns those off from your opponent being able to score them. So, you know, we've talked through all three of your abilities. You've got Conjure Trauma, which injures people. We've got Nightmare Shroud, which is a defensive bubble effectively. And then Harbinger of Despair to mess around with people's scoring. Which combination of the three do you end up taking more often than not? Because there's got to be one that's kind of an all-star. Or maybe, you know, it's like, you know, you take the two based on the matchup and the map every time. And, you know, there's no real hard and fast rules. But I, I got to I mean, expect with such an off meta pick, there's probably something that you've fallen back to as a kind of like a, a safe option. I think Conjure Trauma is the one I take nearly every mission. It's pretty rare for me. I think the only time I might not have taken Contra Trauma was against um, Chaos Colts. Because Nightmare Shroud... Guys. Nightmare Shroud is is really great into them. Um, you turn off all their relentless rerolls and stuff, and, um, you know, that's a two APL team. So you can just pop a pop their near points and with a Harbinger, uh, Harbinger of Despair and, and shut off their scoring. Or even with that, like, if they get one devotee on a point, uh, you can just run one Immortal up and and win it so you can you can use that with, with positioning and and if the last time i played against cults was on a diagonal map so like i feel like diagonal maps on octarius don't really count okay <laughs> against a horde team with a with a flying model with a blast like that it's just it's just like not fair for them because they're like all right i got 15 dudes to put behind this triangle with like two pieces of terrain. Yeah. I, you know, depending on how people develop their diagonal boards, you know, if there's only two pieces of terrain on the line, then with those 15 models, you're either spreading out, which you probably should do, or you yeah. get blasted. Yeah. Um, either way, you're going to eat an alpha strike. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd rather eat an out. alpha strike on like two dorks that i don't care about that are like in the open versus <laughs> six dudes that die <laughs> yeah that's honestly like such an important point that like no one's talking about where it's like if you know you're living an alpha strike game just choose somebody for your opponent to hit it's just like here's a goon unengaged standing like on the corner with no cover just like doing whatever and then there's going <laughs> to be a lot of like telegraphed pressure elsewhere and then people can either like engage your goon and suffer later or not and also suffer later. And like that's a totally valid thing. Right. And I and I think there's this this uh thing with a lot of especially newer horde players. I mean, we in the Twin Cities, I feel like we don't have like a dedicated regular, like really solid vet guard player 
Oh, we have a couple of people that are solid with blooded. Um, but like, we don't have anyone that's really like tuning us up with huge horde teams right now. And so most of the folks that I run into, like they, they are like, oh, my horde team all has to hide and cover and I'm going to get everyone in there. And then, you know, you just clip one edge of an engaged base on like a plasma gunner or something like that with like a move dash shoot. And like half the team is gone. Or if not gone, they're just so messed up it doesn't matter. Um and yeah, it's almost a, like a it's like a, a tip for, almost. for new players. Like, you know, if you know that your opponent is gonna do something, then just take it in the most advantageous way possible instead of taking it in the worst way possible. It might not be the easiest thing to see, but know that if your opponent has these big blast threats that they're angling to fly up to the midboard to nuke you, they are gonna do it, you know, depending on whether it's going to be a legionary with a fire blast. Or a Psychomancer with four APL and a, a blast weapon. Make sure yeah. that you are taking and making your opponent shoot the things that you want to shoot rather than just losing on the spot. Yeah, using your obscuring is super important there too. Making sure that like, hey, you can get those get those lines off. Um, yeah, the the other one like Nightmare Shroud versus Harbinger of Despair really depends on the matchup. Uh, Conjure Trauma is like as always take because like I said you can just like even if you're pointing at a sniper turning a um if you if they get like a, a sniper up on a vantage point they're like alright I got my cover and my camo cloak and my silent two up mortal wounds three um sniper rifle just hitting them up to injured and making them hit on threes can actually be pretty big pretty helpful um, yeah, vet guard. The vet guard sniper with take aim is much less threatening when it can actually miss because four dice on twos versus four dice on threes. You know, even with reroll ones, there's at least now there's a fail case. The, the unholy shooting team, I think I've got the most games into to is Casterkin, and they have pretty much the same sniper except they can just say that's a crit. So it's it's almost even worse. I've had a couple times where it's like, oh yeah, so uh, there's like three crits coming in, that's nine more wounds. Like, uh. And that's where you would wish that you had a Nightmare Shroud going, but yeah. if it's a sniper on their deployment zone, there's just no re room for you to get that Nightmare Shroud in place. Yeah. Uh, I will say one thing, if you have a silent gun, um, like a powerful silent weapon, that is like one thing that Hero Tech I find for like for players that are trying to figure out, okay, this is the new, like, the Boogeyman team. They got buffed. They just won Adepticon. Um, bring a sniper like that. Higher tech has terrible tech against um, something in Conceal on a vantage point. Our normal way of getting rid of Conceal is getting on a vantage point as well. So if you're up there, I, I'm not probably not going to be charging you with my three flying models, because they're either shrimp or they're my leader. Um, our, I would argue for its points value here, tech has the worst grenade of for the EP you pay for it in the game. It's a, it's a, yeah, especially compared to like your regular shooting profile where like everything is crack grenades. And then what is it? It's three, four blast, uh, nothing else special. It's not even, it's three, four lethal five. It's not even blast. It's a three EP. The single target scarab that goes to hit the opponent in the face. Yeah, and it, it, thematically, it, it, it's ball very cool because it's yeah. it's a nano scarab uh, devourer swarm, whatever. Where you just like throw <laughs> a cloud of bugs that just eat you into dust. Very cool thematically. I feel like that should be like a melt a bomb. Honestly, I I was I think what I think it needs is torrent. So then you're actually like sending a cloud out that could hit multiple people. It's not getting blast, so it's not like completely like plasma grenading everyone for, up. For three EP in the context of Necrons, it should be exactly what it is, but also blast and also AP one. I said <laughs> it. I said it. I, I, I accept these terms. They got, they got all the buffs they need, but like that's what I would do just for. Yeah, yeah let's, not, let's not get ahead of ourselves uh, and buff. Buff the one of the better teams Look, in the format now. It's nothing about the buffs, it's just for the vibes. Yeah. Um but, but yeah, so either way. Um and like and for it once you get a sniper up in that vantage point, so many of those snipers have like a camo cloak. So if I'm only hitting a few times, you're you're just blocking two with cover. It is the snipers, the Kiasican sniper, the um Pathfinder sniper, anything that can just sit up high with a with a silent weapon in cover 
is a huge issue. I can't roller skates or I can't just, um, you know, APL3 charge up a, a Despotech into you, especially not without the yeah. rocket. You know, this is where the uh, Chronomancer's Chrononometron would come in play, right? Because you would get the extra movement so you can make a charge move and go dunk on it. Go dunk a dork in, in cover. So yeah. when you're playing against these teams with the Psychomancer, you know, you've mentioned that there's a little bit of a downside when you're dealing with indirect. So how have you been approaching these problems? Are you playing the points more often? Are you lining up to angle a guy around the other edge? Or are you just basically ignoring them and just taking the shot and using your reanimation and your higher higher saves and your high wound counts to basically just tank through the damage? Yeah, usually what I do in those cases, I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to eat those sniper shots. I'll try to set out something. Um, like, like we said, counterplaying the blast. I'm going to try to set out something that's going to be less... less uh, important in the long run um or like you know you want you want your opponent to keep shooting at you and have them not move because if the sniper is just standing there and you deal with everything else it's just a dude on top of a building shooting your guys which is fine ultimately because kill team is a game about points like you can kill as many things as you want but they're not killing the right things while they're scoring points away from you doesn't really matter so like while snipers can be annoying if you are finding ways to grab points away from your opponent that's probably just as fine so you know i know when shane was on here he talked about how his plasma sites have done a little bit of shooting have you found certain pieces pulling a little bit more weight with the psychomancer are Um, you using immortals with the phase blades to go get some melee attacks in that you wouldn't expect otherwise um i have had i have had my immortals um and i my i almost exclusively just take like three hyper phase blades and the phase shifter Unless there's like, unless they just don't have an AP gun, then I might take um, the phase oculars and switch those out on the uh, death mark to get more crits with that. Um, but yeah, the so since immortals punch, they they have space marine fists, right? The three, four, four attacks hit on threes, which is like the the most solid average middle line. They're they're amazing into horde teams. I'll often if I'm if I'm able to pop up the plus two move um march ability and just charge in and start just like haymakering vet guard they do work you get lethal five up you just need one hit or like a crit and a hit or two and you'll just like wreck some wreck some mans yeah the lethal five makes them like very very reliable into stuff like vet guard which is like kind of like an undersold statement yeah and if or if if you could put and it and like vet guards are usually going to have enough folks that it's going to be difficult to do this, but like maybe it gets blooded. If you can get a lineup where you can charge two of their two of their move dudes and just eviscerate one, and you can just stand at the other because you know you're a ten wound operative with four attacks and melee, unless they're a dedicated melee operative, just random guardsman Steve is is never going to punch his way through you. They have to disengage and they have to lose that at activation. I actually did have one hero game with like one immortal killed three vet guard in melee in two turns. Right. Because one of them decided to start a fight with you to do chip damage for the other and you killed uh, him in response. I yeah, one of that was that. I actually got a charge off on my opponent's um demo guy. I like, trapped him in melee. It was like a loot, so I like looted the point, and then I just charged the demo guy. I'm like, okay, you're not going to bomb anyone with this. And then he charged in the confident, and I think the hardened veteran, and just like Ginsu diced them all, healed up in between a couple. Um, and you know, one of the funner things is that your psychomancer can command one of your immortals that is in melee to do a fight because you're allowed a fight, an Overwatch, a pickup, or a mission action. So. Having an immortal that gets charged, your opponent's like, ah, oh, whatever. I, like, they write them off, right? Because they're like, yeah. oh, you know, I'm not going to kill you. You're not going to kill me. But if your immortal fights, does a little bit of damage, then your your cryptic can basically tell him afterwards to finish the job. And he will probably finish the job most of the time. Yeah. The, um... Yeah, one of the challenges that I found is any, like, other elite class melee is is just gonna wipe the floor with you you know like as soon as legionaries lines start hitting your lines it's just a terrible day to be a necron um 
you're you're never killing the anointed if he gets into you. Which I mean, I mean I, the goal I, the goal would be to get killed, do one hit back, res, and then shoot him in the face. Hopefully, yeah. It's a and um I need to replay Nurgle Legionary, um, one of our local You've talked about Jamie a little bit, right, Jason? Yeah. On the cast, yeah, like Jamie is a is a really solid player, and every time I've faced his Nurgle Legionary, he's absolutely just like mopped the floor with me. And a lot of that is like I'm a, I was kind of a, a Tesla believer for a long time, or a Gauss believer for a long time. So they hit me these these four or five AP one guns. He's like, all right, uh, just like auto like save two, and then just dunk all the damage. Yeah, Nurgle Legionary is surprisingly tough against shooting, so finding yeah. ways to crack armor is really, really important. And obviously, back when you were doing this testing, I suspect you were on a three-up res, ro- res roll compared to nowadays, which <laughs> is a two-up res roll. And that is a big difference, because now you can really like take a line of hits, get put down, and then res immediately after. Yeah. And that can be make or break. Granted, you can't have your opponent's Nurgle lines in your lines die, get back up, because one of your dudes is not going to be able to take the following Marines charge, fight, kill, shoot someone else. Like that's not really a thing that you can do. So you do need to do a good job on the, as they're coming in to kill one or two of those legionaries Mm -hmm. before they make it into melee. Yeah. That's very important. Um, Also, I I do need to try that matchup with Tesla since they're, um, they're grotesque, whatever. I forget the names of all the, the nasty Nurgle things, but they, they have that uh, mutagenic flesh. Basically mutagenic minus flesh. one damage against normal damage to a minimum of three. So if you're taking Goss, which is four dice on threes, four, five, it's four dice on threes, three, five versus five dice on threes, three, three, splash one. Yeah. And the Tesla is, is really solid. It's also really good. It's great into like Siege Legionary or Harlequins. Um, so this is a really case bad. of you adjusting to your opponent by adding more dice because you you know that against Nurgle Legionary, you're going to get probably two saves, a, a, a normal save and a crit save, which means that your five dice or four dice on threes, three, five profile is probably going to be doing three to six damage on average versus the five dice on threes chance of doing some amount of crit uh, splash damage and also overwhelming your opponent's save. Like they could save three, but then they've taken hopefully one crit and they've taken one hit, which is four damage, which is not bad. Yeah, and so if they, bring them down. you know, roll unlucky, which is often a thing that happens, you know, they will make one or two saves. Then you're forcing through, you know, two to three hits, which can be maybe a little bit more damage, maybe not that much more, but you're just, it's an adaptation for the matchup that you've seen. Yeah, definitely something I've, um i've rolled around with the the other thing though for so like since legionary are so good at just uppercutting other elites necrons are diet elite is is kind of what i call them because they're a six model team and they got like the immortals punch like baseline space marines but like that's as hard as they hit they don't have anything harder than three four in melee um and And necrons are you know, definitely not a melee team. When your best profile is four dice on threes, three, four with yeah. lethal five. That's, that's four your dice best. On twos. Yeah, four dice on twos, three, four, lethal five. That's your best profile. That's not yeah. that's not where you want to be in melee. Like you are definitely a shooting first team that happens to have an elite number of aggro pieces and then two dorks to kind of help you score points and cover the rest of your holes. And the, and the tech, yeah, the tech on the. I I remember when they added the free. They made the actions on the shrimp free. And the plasma sites because it used to be it used to be basically a normal comms where you could pass but it was a point to action and the the medic used to be you could res but it was an ap to res and when they opened that up it was just like the the skies parted and the sun shone down and like i can actually score points on loot now and maybe kill some things um but the thing that legionary have and other uh really heavy hitting i'm sure like we haven't played the matchup, Jason, but I'm sure your all assault intercessor um, team would probably kind of do this too. If you can get double kills on Necrons, and Legionary are really good at that, you know, you get your Malefic Blade, Melt a Gunner, or something like that coming in, pop two Immortals in one activation, or the leader comes in and pops two Immortals in one activation. Um, the res can't keep up because you can only res at max two guys a turn. Unless you're playing techno, which I'm not here to talk about, because 50 millimeter base is awful. Oh yeah, he is a big chunky boy. Okay. 
you know, as far as talking about overall game plans, you know, you've talked about how you chip away at your opponent's lines with these extra hyperphase blades on your immortals. Where do you fall as far as the tack up selection? I know that on this podcast, over time, we've gone from recon lets you be a shooting team that scores actively to coming all the way back around now to saying security is actually where it's at. You don't need to score on turn one if you score all of your points on turn four. Where is the Psychomancer um, in the meadow right now? I've been running um, a slightly built different build than I, I, I mean, I listened to the last podcast that Shane was on and listened to Command Point also. Um, so I've heard a, a lot of what he's had to say on it. Um, I run a little bit differently but I, on security, but I do still run security. I, when I first started, I ran security because I'm like, oh, I just need to stand there to do the points. And then I've heard like, oh, recon's the really good one. I'll try that out. Having such a limited number of actions makes um, having to go a specific place and being so limited in movement outside of a couple options. Um I mean, Apprentic is just a space marine now. Uh, Cryptex has three actions, but you need your you need your shrimp to be around either scoring primaries or supporting your immortals and and your and your Cryptek. So they can't just go like gallivanting off. If I'm against a team that I out activate, I might take recon and take recover item and like secure vantage because usually they can't manu- out maneuver you to get those. Especially if you just teleport a death mark down onto the, um, onto the re- recover item, but the uh, I usually take central control, courier, and unyielding ancients, um, because that just gives you like at the end of the game you just got to have your crypt tech fly over to their deployment area. Uh, put courier on that or put i actually usually put courier on the accelerator plasma site because i can keep it safer it doesn't have to be running around shooting stuff and doing work so end of game i can just like zip over maybe down to one of their objectives and move dash it across like nine inches across the entire board and get those two points on that at the end of the game it doesn't ha- you mean escort operative not courier right yes I was, I, like, I, don't know. I was like, yeah. I don't know, that sounds like cheating right now, if you could take courier yeah. along with the security stuff. No, But yes, um, there is escort operative. Escort operative is you declare an operative, I think, at the second turn? Second turn, first or second. Second turn, and then if they survive at the end of the game, in your opponent's drop zone, you get two points. If they're in your opponent's territory, or like within in six inches of your well. opponent's drop zone, you get one point. Yeah, it's pretty much like courier, but a little bit more telegraphed. Which is totally Way more fine. Telegraphed. Yeah, a lot more telegraphed. Which is totally fine if you, if you like crush the flank. Yeah, or if you just have a nine-inch move dash flying shrimp with super conceal that they're you know buried in immortals and just can't deal with. Um, and like the reanimator shrimp has an enormous target on its head because as soon if they can kill that, you know they, so they they. Um, that's usually my go-to. Um, then central control is, again, like, you can kind of just roll it up, but it, it plays to that game plan of just get my dudes in the middle or towards your side of the board. I have also, for Elite, started doing um, Worthy of Study, which is Necron or Hero Tech Circle Faction Tech Op 3, which is at during turning point 1 or turning point 2, you designate... Um, two of your opponent's models and they get to choose one and that model becomes worthy of study and this is a kind of hard to to score tack up because you have to kill that model and then it becomes a token like you get like a little corpse that you play a token for its corpse and then you have to have another mod you have to control that token and then have either your print tech or crypt tech within six inches of that token as well to score it twice but if you're playing into elites, you can put that on their like their far advanced melee beaters and say, hey, if you're going to charge that assault intercessor into me and like get them in the middle of my lines, I'm going to turn you into a token that I can just sit and score on. And if you can get that on an objective point, it just makes that that easier for you. Um, or I had a I played it into Harlequins this last weekend and I put it on a Harlequin and my opponent is just like, I'm gonna run that Harlequin away. I'm like, great, I just took a clown out of the game. So my opponent can deny me two tech ops and I'll take that flank. 
Um, but yeah, otherwise, uh, unyielding ancients on um, on into the dark. I will take uh, unearth artifice, which is their second tech up, which is you place a token. It is to start a game reveal. You place a token more than six inches from your deployment zone. But that means you can walk a model six inches and be controlling it. Um, and on Into the Dark, I'll just pop that token down and I'll, it's a two APL action or two AP action to bury up whatever, whatever fancy ancient Necron or Kaotech is there. And then you sit on it for one turn and then you just have to go sit on it at the end of the game, which is a perfect thing for one of your bugs to just zip around a couple corners to do um end of the game and it's usually a pretty easy two two victory points on into the dark and it also kind of puts your pr your pressure on your opponent because they're like wait you scored one of your tack ops or like half of one of your tack ops already and we haven't even started opening doors yet this so it kind of starts putting the, the heat on them to keep going yeah um and kind of be aggressive into your nightmare shroud this leads me into one of the questions that I've had throughout the whole episode, and uh, like I've, I've dabbled in Hyrotech a little bit, and I just I just got like the kit that came with Shadow Vault, so I've got a Technomancer, and mm -hmm. like he's the only Crypt deck I have. It's you know it's kind of fun to noodle around with like newer player games, whatever. Um, but I found that like it's like the shrimps are such a utility outside of their purpose that I pretty much don't use them for their purposes very often like i might get one revive and one extra apl and then other than that they just they have an they have another purpose and i'm wondering for like a real hyrotech per, for a real hyrotech circle player do you have a similar outlook or like is your apl dude actually doing apl multiple times um i usually have my apl i usually have the accelerator pass out apl two or three times a game um, and a lot of that, and part of being a, a good hero tech player is keeping everything within your support net and making sure that you can get those. And fortunately, the shrimp are flexible enough that you can get them places. And since that APL action is free, you can usually position in a way that you're like, okay, turning point one, I'm going to move, I'm going to loot that point you know, at worst, right? So I'm going like hardest case scenario, which is loot. I'm going to move there, I'm going to loot that, I'm going to pass an APL um to my despotech after he's activated so my despotech is going to go into turning point three two with three apl um and then during turning point two i'll move again i often i'll pop two apl on the despotech like two or three times a game if the despotech has run off and just started ginsuing people or, or gets blasted by a plasma gun um that i should have seen coming or something uh i'll just pop it on another immortal um and then turning point two i'll usually put like i said i usually put uh what's that tech up that we talked about that i forgot the name of again uh, about, uh, the two apl um no the one you have to run across the board talk about escort escort operative escort operative yeah then i'll usually pop escort operative on them and start moving them but i'm moving that uh that accelerator drone in positions where I can pop out APL either before or after the move. And since it's a six inch visible bubble, you have a pretty good amount of wiggle room. So it's just six inches from whatever um, objective point you're moving to. And you also have fly. So you just go wherever you want with those things. Is that a zero APL action that to hand it off? I did get changed. It did get changed to zero APL. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's an action. So it's not like at the start of your activation, you can hand it off. It's like no, it's you can do a zero APL action. Okay. That makes it way better. Yeah. I mean, I've even had time where it's like, all right, I'm going to move APL that guy and then dash into cover somewhere. But like you had to go, go out um, somewhere a little risky. Maybe if I had my death mark kind of in, in deep or something. Uh, and the reanimator I move to turning point one and turning point two. My reanimator is definitely keeping in positions where I can hit reanimations more. Um, that's its goal because turning point three and four, especially four, like four, the the reanimator doesn't matter anymore. It it's it is then just a tech piece. Um, but even like turning point three, maybe, but turning point one and two, it is vital to keep your 
key pieces in line of that medic. You have to be able to get those extra action actions to revive. And granted, you can make your game plan around, okay, my Apprentic is going there, my Despotech is going there, I got another Immortal here. Um, I'm going to move my Reanimator into position to cover those three models and still be on a, on a point. Yeah, again, the 12-inch bubbles, or like the 12-inch diameter bubbles, means that as long as you're paying attention, you can generally keep your reanimation beam focused on the people or the the Necrons that are out in the open. You know, obviously the death mark is going to go up, get a shot off maybe within, you know, in wherever position he is. The leader can take his 4 APL, fly over into an aggressive position. And if your opponent decides to punish any of these pieces, they have to commit on turn one to having more engaged models, which means that if you can get them to do it early, you can shoot them back. And if you have a free reanimation, all the better, because that means that you're really not losing that much as far as taking a trade. As long as you win the initiative next turn and you don't have your guy yeah. explode. But, you know, with the way that reanimation works now, you always basically res in effectively a safe position if you lose a guy on turn one. Yeah, I so actually I could... didn't. I didn't realize that. So when I was originally figuring out Hero Tech, I thought it was. And so this is a for the people just figuring out the team. Um, you can you you always get to reanimate. Your opponent cannot block your reanimation tokens. Um, I've come from some other games where you could position in a way that if you had a mechanic like that, your opponent could block it. Um, so when I was first looking at reanimation, I thought, oh, if they're standing on my token and I can't come back, which is not the case. It's just you have to move further out. So it took me a little while. Like I think it was just last week that someone was like, no, you get to just move your place your model three inches further away so i've been playing reanimation on hard mode this entire time i think the only way that your opponent could theoretically block you on a reanimation right now is if they had enough models set up in a constellation around a debt like a reanimation token where there is no spot for your operative to be placed and nowhere within three inches for you to be placed then maybe uh, there on, is an argument the dark. yeah like it's possible yeah. very unlikely basically like it would require enough operatives in a constellation that would definitely be blastable for them to stand <laughs> in a position where, you know, there's nowhere within because it is yeah. within three inches of the reanimation token, but not within engagement range of the enemy operatives. Yeah, so it is maybe theoretically possible, but very, very difficult for a single operative to do. They yeah. would need to have probably like four operatives, I would expect. To maybe basically a, screen maybe out a bubble. Maybe Pox Hulk on one of the stupid freestanding beta decima. Yeah, it's 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 possible. Like I won't say it's not possible. It is physically possible by the rules, and there is no rider in the reanimation rules like there are in Chaos Cults where you can always res. So on Chaos Cults, you know, Alexa was on here forever ago, basically yep. talking about how if you set up your uh, mutation pop correctly, you can actually bubble up your own Chaos Cults, turn into a mutant, and because there's no legal place to put you, you actually pop over above a barricade because there is a rider in the Chaos Cult rules that basically says you must be placed. Uh, there is no rider here. There is well, just it's a ten B, I think, isn't mm -hmm. it? I'd have to look at it. No, basically for chaos cults, you actually get to like move. Yeah. You get to push models around a little bit. Like you can ignore your oh, own places yeah. and push yourself out. Whereas there's no rider for it. <laughs> there's no rider for it on the higher tech circle. But for a single operative, basically impossible. For maybe three or four operatives, it might be possible. And then it would basically say that for that first bullet point, maybe it is possible to screen you out. It's just very hard. And if they do that, they are basically setting themselves up to get blasted. Because it's not like you don't have enough guns to kill four dudes standing around a corpse. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and, and OK, so the, that's the you can stand, you change orders and revive within three inches of your token. That's like okay. not if you're blocked it's just no matter what right yeah well you could physically set up enough models where there's nowhere for you to set up a, uh, a new operative that is not within engagement range so it is possible just not with one operative yeah, it's like at, and and like at that point at what cost like, exactly I th no, no, I like the thing is, i'm saying that it is possible you, uh, by, yeah. by the letter of the law it for sure is possible but it requires a lot of operatives and it requires a lot of commitment so it's not like you wouldn't see it coming you know it requires it requires the the, the greatest player at the uh, second Paul Bunyark World Championship Invitational. Uh, we had a local player, Jack, run Max Grotz. Great skins. Oh, yes, of course. The all Gretchen yeah. revolution. I suppose at Paul Bunyark, this is a, an acceptable line of argumentation. It was the... Um, 
Knob, two Rocket Boys, and everything else was Gretchen. Yes, that is the that is the argument for it. I don't having it did having talked to people. Well. It'll win a handful was, of games. Was, like if you don't take well. if you don't take a bunch of Gretchen seriously, you will just get bogged down by a bunch of dorks and not enough melee steps mm-hmm. to free yourself off your two midboard points. Yeah, um, but it's not a good strategy, and I wouldn't suggest to anyone doing it. And I also don't think technically in the rules it. I'm pretty sure the rules were not written to allow it, but it is just at the edge of english uh reading where people do it uh i would not suggest people do it it, it wasn't pure also, gretchen they had three actual uh, yeah you have to take so basically the argument is that for every boy you can take two gretchen and you can only take 20 operatives on the battlefield anyways because there's only 20 roster slots oh, true, yeah. so you fill up you fill up i think 16 gretchen and then everything else is is models yeah. but like is it worth doing not really it's just kind of a fun meme um Again, the ability to actually block out uh, Hero Tech Circle reanimation res is possible, just very hard. Yeah. Or um, like, you know, three Geller Pox Hulks standing on your corpse, sure. But like right. at that point, there's three Geller Pox Hulks kind of like noodling around doing nothing. So it's not the worst thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that three inch revive that they gave us two data slates or I go, I think, was, was really big. Uh, being able to, to basically get a free dash out with with that team because here tech unless you're paying cp yeah plus the order change like i i i started playing here tech right after they gave the apprentice or the the crypt tech an extra ballistic skill and i think that was it um so i've gone through all of these all of these changes and the having a guy come back with d3 wounds right where he was with the same engage token was just like worthless it's like oh you're gonna spend another you you literally just need to like pop me with the last gun and my faction ability that you had to pay pay a command point to use is gone um, so like every incremental change to to resurrection protocols has been has been really really nice for the team and really opened up their abilities. Um, yeah, the the last the last data slate, uh, just in general, I've played Chromancer a few times. I I wasn't a huge fan of the counter to temporal nano mine because it was just it's just like an unpleasant amount of control that you you like you pop that down and your opponent just kind of deflates a little bit and you're like okay now we're not really playing a game for fun anymore which is you know what kill team ultimately is um i i almost felt a lot of the times that like when playing the psychomancer which is supposed to be like the trauma literally has a, an ability with trauma in the name but like counter temporal trauma mind was would have been a better name for that one um, before the nerf, that thing was just oppressive. Um, but it was real. It's really the the Chronometron Turbo Roller Skates that I love on the on the trip of the Chronomancer. The um, the the Turbo Boosted Despotech is a monster. You know. Yeah, I don't remember if that ended up making one of the previous podcasts or not. But I remember one of the conversations I had with Shane. Was, yeah, it was on. That was actually what what uh, tuned me into it. It was like, wait, you can do what with the Despotech? I need to try my my Chronomancer out. Yeah, pretty bonkers. Um, and that's like it, it, the main power piece within it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and even without uh, Nano Mine now, just having a you know four up in Volt save, five up feel no pain, dude, flying around, twelve inch move dashing with a blast weapon is is pretty dirty. Um, yeah, higher tech definitely has all the tools and all the all the ability. Yeah. It really is just the limitation of your APL. And if you cannot plan where you need to put your operatives and your APL, you are going to struggle. Because as powerful as the team is, it is effectively a sixteen AP or like a eighteen it's APL. 18, team. It's eighteen APL now, so, so it's, it's in line with true elites. It's in line with true elites, but it punches way harder or like way less hard in some aspects. Mm-hmm. And you have to be way more intentional about where you're going to be positioning. Yeah. So the, have you really found, hard. I mean, you know, you said you had an 80% win rate with the Psychomancer. Where have you found the hardest games? Um, and what, you, well, like, what, are, what is the matchup spread? Like what's easy, what's hard? Um, I actually find most of the other 8 to 10 model operative teams are, are pretty 
pretty good matchups for hero tech anything with eight wounds and a four up save is just absolute dog meat against gauss weapons when every one of your guns is a crack grenade even if they're in cover it's like a coin flip that they survive um unless unless you completely botch the roll and if you roll like the the death mark and the despotech with gauss just delete a dude every single shot because they're they're too up to hit so unless you're rolling pretty cold they can usually get a reroll. so unless you're rolling pretty cold they're just rolling four hits and it's like all right you're taking eight wounds even if you save out two um and then usually you can beat up those teams in melee horde teams um again psychomancer has some good options for like controlling the the score line on that so unless you're running into like control against them uh you're you're doing okay or capture unless you're running capture into them you're doing okay intercessors i'm kind of even on phobos um phobos jason and i we need to play again because last time our only game was with your max and cursors on beta decima and i like left my deployment zone and was vaporized uh you you can't you can only re resurrect so many dudes after getting just aced turning point one where you can't even see your opponent yet um the jason jason's all in cursor spam has been nerfed yeah yeah uh i didn't laugh when i saw it out loud um in front of jason <laughs> The I, I still think it's gonna be perfectly fine. Beta Decima just has its own issues. The uh Intercessors is fine. It, uh Phobos is a really interesting matchup because it's two really tricky teams that have like kind of level feel on punching. And it's entirely gonna be depend I think that one is like a, a, a true even, like that one's gonna depend on player skill. And I f I feel like um Omni's like uh infiltrator spam with omni scramble is like a nightmare for higher oh, yeah. circle yeah if you can control where when the chronomance <laughs> when the good tech gets to go it's a it's a real bad day but i feel like it'll um, be like in in like a tournament context it'll be pretty easy to avoid because there's not a lot of phobos players and they're probably not going to be like top yeah cut. um now that you know um let's see Elf teams are really interesting. Harlequins were way, way harder before they had to obey terrain rules. Um, and, and yeah, so their invuln save makes makes Gauss not great, but Tesla really messes them up a lot. Um, horde teams, I, I, I need to get a few more games in. I've played Pathfinders a couple times, and the shooting trading gets really interesting there. Because again, and this happens with Casterkin, like uh we have a local guy, Mike, who's a huge Casterkin guy. He's the only one who played Casterkin at Adepticon. And I think he went four and three, if I remember correctly. So he does pretty well with them. And it has been like every time we've played here at Tech versus Casterkin, it's been an absolute uh massacre because they can trade piece for piece, but when your immortals come back and then kill another casterkin the, the the peace trade falls out real real bad um true horde teams you really got to hit that control uh you need to be using you need to be threatening the blast alpha super hard so they have to spread out you need to be able to i think that's probably one of like a really solid horde team is probably a huge challenge um but if you can get that blast off and kill like three or four dudes early that that makes a big difference too. So it's it's something that'd be interesting to see. Um we don't have anyone, like I said earlier, we don't have anyone like really tuning people up with Horde around here, so it's hard to say. We have a couple folks switching to Admech, I think, though. Um I am interested to see Nemesis Claw. Because six inch shooting is kind of where Heretech wants to be for uh relentless onslaught anyway. So as soon as we can get there, get to a point where we ignore their obscuring, we are ignoring their faction ability. <clears throat> yeah, and I think with like Nemesis Claw, they pretty much like it's just for their turn one approach, and then after that, <laughs> you can't really like afford to be on conceal anymore. Yeah, and like Gauss Blasters are gonna give those things nightmares. Yeah, they're gonna eat them up. 
Yeah. Uh, but that but if they get into melee it could it can get a double kill off, that's gonna be a big problem. Uh, yeah, I think I mean here at tech I, I feel like uh don't other than like, you know, some bad experiences with Nurgle Legionary, I feel like in general the team is doesn't have something they look at as like a massive weakness right now. Uh have you done any like Felgor games? Uh I actually don't hate Felgor. The, yeah. According the to Shane, Felgor is one of the better matchups just because they go in, they frenzy, and then you get up and you blow them up again. Mm-hmm. Or like yeah. they hit you once and then they go away. Because like yeah. they can't really kill you again in melee. And with the lethal five, if they come at you w- while frenzied, you have a non zero chance of just like doinking them, taking four, and moving on. Because they have to approach you, you can actually shoot them pretty nicely on the way in. Mm-hmm. Um, I need it's, to play my current understanding of how Shane receives that matchup. The, the lethal five up is like uh is really brutal for them um and because i can have lethal five up on if i want to all f- all of my primary combatants like i could p- potentially just take five immortals with hyperface blades like four immortals in a in a tech um conjure trauma on their like leader or something that wants to support and get up um is, is really nice Nightmare Shroud is awful for them because then even if they do frenzy and they charge you and you roll a crit, they can't roll a crit to hit you back anymore. They can't parry out and just beat you to death. They have to take that crit. So I think I think Felgor's is fine to match up. I'd be interested. To, I uh, I haven't played against Scouts. Um, I feel like Scouts wouldn't wouldn't love the matchup, but it's hard to say because they do again have the opportunity for a good amount of conceal shooting and some good obs- uh, obscured shooting, and they have some really heavy guns. Scouts are like a weirdly... They're they're kind of like living in the gatekeeper realm where, like, they're gonna, like, punch above their weight class, but I don't think they're gonna make it to, like, the upper levels. So it's like, if you play against a really good scout player in an early round at a tournament, they could knock you out, but, like, the scouts themselves aren't really gonna, like, win anything. And then, like, once they get... Once you get into, like, the second and fourth rounds and whatever, it's like, scouts aren't really, like, a threat anymore. Yeah, they live and die on their first turn, and because you're a team that lives and dies by their third and fourth turn, it's just... Not a great spot for the scouts to be. Like, once they're out of their scouting tricks, they, like, kill sure. one of your dudes, you get back up, and you just shoot back, and you're like, alright, that's cool. Yeah. We'll just uh, we'll just play the later game. So, yeah, I think Hero Tech pretty, pretty well covered, though. I I have run for equipment every once in a while. I'll take, like, the Tesla Weave. But yeah, usually it's just Hyperphase Blades. I, uh, if I'm feeling cheeky, I'll take the narrow, Nano Scarab Swarm and uh, usually botch the roll, even with two rerolls. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> yeah grenades yeah. that have no chemistry uh, i feel like with any team is just like don't ever bother it's like phobos well, don't bother with any grenades you don't have any synergy with them well that's the problem is um uh, there is it's a six inch range i have a strat ploy that i use basically every turn after turning point one that gives me a reroll within six and you can use demand on the on the despotech to give a free command point reroll and then i'll still roll up and be like all right i hit on threes and roll like re-roll into twos again or something yeah it's like it's like well, you get three just... hits and then they save one or two and it's like you didn't they have a cannon it's their sniper I mean, so they auto t- auto retain too yeah yeah i mean as far as like the expected value of uh nano really scarab it's just really not that great because it's effectively just a bolter with lethal yeah so against a seven wound model you're probably not even likely to kill them unless you roll really really hot which is definitely not a guarantee well, it's like yeah. even if you roll a really really hot they're gonna be like hmm, just hurt or, or it's like, oh no, you killed my one of my fourteen guardsmen with like three equipment a, points three, and a big a, effort. A, a three <laughs> activation setup. That that is the the thing about Kiratek is also Kiratek is like the ultimate catch twenty two team. There's so many turns I turn in where I'm like, okay, um, I want my Apprentic to be there, but I need my Cryptek there first, and then before my Cryptek goes, my Despotech needs to be here. And so you have all these pieces that need to be in place kind of at the same time that can't be. So you're constantly sacrificing um, options to get into the positions you need to be or putting models into positions that are risky, um, which, again, you reanimate so you can kind of 
kind of toss that a bit more. You can be a lot more aggressive with um, Hero Tech than you can with a true elites team because, like, once your intercessor, your Phobos guy is gone, that's that's it. You're not getting another one. Um, so Hero Tech is forgiving on like, oh, I lost a model, it can come back probably. But as far as like where your stuff has to be in relation to each other, it's very very specific and. If you don't have your Despotech or your Apprentech in good positions when your Cryptech goes, you can lose options for Command, Demand, um, uh, Arcane Conduit shots. Um, one thing I actually like to do is run the Cryptech up early and then Apprentech later so you can Arcane Conduit. You kind of give, like, it's a good way to give the, the Psychomancer sort of an Overwatch option or like a double tap option is just have the Apprentech shoot through it later, which with the 3 APL makes it a lot easier to do. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, the the power there is that you. I don't know. It's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Face it. But... There, there, there's a lot to it. It's it's a fun team because you have like so many combo ups and so many um crazy tricks. I feel like other than the reanimation, I f- feel like nothing in the team at this point is really just like a really nasty gotcha. Um, I mean, I, I understand how much of a feels bad it is to be like, oh, right, I set all this up, I plasma gunnered that thing, it's dead now, and next turning point it comes back to life, and if your plasma gunner doesn't activate first and kill it again, I'm going to kill your plasma gunner. Um, the, the peace trading game into them is is tipped on its head. Yeah, the real thing is if you can manage, like for, for a higher tech player, your goal is to have exactly two pieces die each turn. And as long as it's a new two pieces every turn, you basically yeah. get 12 operatives that can do damage. And, and even if it's like the, the ones that I most often have die and then die right again away are usually just my 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 mook immortals, which fine. Um, yep, they're there but, to score points, drag your opponent's attention and do a little bit of chip damage. Yeah, I mean, chip damage is often like half of an intercessor. Yeah. Yeah, you <laughs> get damage in the context of this team, right? Where you're, yeah. everyone has a crack grenade. A crack grenade gun is is pretty pretty nuts. Um, yeah, they they also can be like depending on terrain layouts, they can be have a hard time because of you have like supreme mobility with three operatives, and then no mobility with another like four of them. Yeah, I mean that's the that's probably when you would switch in and out the chronomancer or the technomancer. For the matchups, so hopefully yeah. you know. Next time you're on here, I mean, next time you're on here, you know, you'll be able to use the Psychomancer and the Technomancer and the Chronomancer and have I all have... three, all three Cryptex live in harmony. I, I I need to put the Techno. I feel like the Technomancer is a good um, play into newer players that haven't run into to um, Kiratech again, Kiratech Hec- before, because it's. I mean, it's heal more. But it's more of a lose less operative than a win harder operative. You can be a little more gutsy and and get a little bit more of that. But you're not getting these like really mean like turbo roller skates. Hey, this guy just like showed up in your deployment zone and like killed your two most important models. No, just your first most important model with your AP2 yeah. gun, right? Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah, so I feel like the Technomancer might be a good pick against players that haven't run into the team very much. It makes the it makes the keeping them down harder. Um but it doesn't but it, it really just like is hero tech harder without all like the really nasty tricks that the Chronomancer and the Technomancer have. Um and it's not there's not this giant blast threat that they have to have to work with. So I've been thinking about that with um with some of the newer players. I so Jason is the main um, main organizer of the Twin Cities community. He runs at Game Centers on Tuesdays. And last year when we kind of did like the, the store split, which is right when I was kind of jumping in into the community, um, I started setting up a shop at uh, one of the Dreamers Falls locations. There's, there's like five of those, I think, or six of those in town. Uh, but so I actually have a like sub community that I started um over at, at that that Dreamers Vault and yeah, it was just like a couple buddies I, I've you know known since high school and been wargaming with forever. 
uh, that I that I tuned in. But we got we're up to like eight ten players on average on Wednesdays now, which has been pretty cool to see. And so keeping that like because I know you guys are very yeah. like, how do you keep your community going? And I'm I'm like, I'll show up on Tuesdays when I can. Uh, but Wednesdays are are the night that I I am pretty much always there unless I'm sick or. No family thing happens. Yeah, Ted's another great example of like consistency is key. Like you've been there all the time, and like you really have been, like, <coughs> like a perfect seed of like creating a whole other additional community within. And like the people that show up to to your events will show up to our tournaments and stuff. And like yeah. you really have like entirely started a whole new scene here. Um, and plus, like you. Um, you started the new scene. Um, you've been working on some maps and stuff, which is some cool, some cool stuff. Yeah, I do a lot of tinkering, and like terrain layout is so important in this game, which is one of the things I love about it. And it's frustrating because you know you got to bring like three shipping containers worth of worth of terrain with whenever you go to game night. Um, but like figuring out like what is an ideal board in a way that's like interesting for both players and gives the defender a little bit of an advantage that having a side of the board because i know a lot of there's a lot of like oh try to make them equal um and i and the terrain theory of kill team is really interesting to me um because of how like how much of the game just revolves around that and so i've been playing especially with beta decima i just sat down one afternoon like on a saturday and just started tinkering with layouts um and and one thing that I, I really try to do with my terrain layouts is make it look like it was a real thing. You know, with a with Octarius, you can usually position the walls in a way that it's like a balanced terrain setup, but also looks like a real slightly fallen apart orc workshop place. Right? Um usually that involves all of the inside corners kind of um like the vantage is all kind of pointing out away from each other for the cover. The the oil pump thing is either in the middle of all of them to block line of sight across, or it's positioned weird so it's off to the side. Um I I under like I have a lot of respect for was it the TPT boards that are are usually used. Um like really greatly designed for tournament. They drive me crazy because they they just don't look like anything that was ever real. Right. It's it's entirely that's entirely a game board setup and not a world that you're playing on. And that's one thing that bothered me with um beta decimas sets is all of those boards are game boards, but they're not lived in. Yes, there's definitely a difference between a balanced game and an immersive game. And I think that ter- most tournament players when they're going for a competitive tournament, I think most people are expecting for there to be like a fair shake. So having everything feel natural has not been the primary goal. I think in narrative campaigns, when I've run those, it doesn't really matter as long as it looks cool. People have fun. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a push and pull there. So you're saying that you've been trying to find uh, campaign board or not campaign boards, tournament boards that feel a little bit more lived in when it comes to beta decima. How, what have you used? Have you just been using what's in the box or have you been using the stuff that comes in with kill, kill team salvation? You know, how, how have you been doing that? So the ones I was setting up was with the salvation pieces, but since not everyone has those and like sourcing those for a full tournament, if you're going to be running beta decima is really difficult. Um, but one thing that got me, and this was before the jump change was made that I was really working on these. Um, and before the visibility change. So I had that in mind, but like, who is designing these platforms just sitting out in the middle of nowhere with nothing to do? So having walkways that are interconnected is one thing that I looked at a lot. It improves the mobility because even with jump tests not having to be a, like not being a role anymore, you can't fail them you're still leaving, you know, two to three inch gaps in the potential movement of the operatives. Um, So having the the boards be interconnected, so they're actually just walkways over the space is something I focused on a lot. Um, The ferritonic furnace on a couple of them is, is central located on one or one or two of the, the, the layouts I did. I actually have it more towards one side than the other. 
So if you're, you know, if you're given, if you're given that attacker defender choice, you might be giving up the furnace if you take first attacker. And I think that's a really interesting play space to go with. Um, and I'm coming into, I, I came in from Kill Team from Star Wars Armada, and that game had a, a, a bidding mechanic with its points that I didn't always love. But learning to play um, for second or first player was actually really important competitively in that game. And I think that's true of Kill Team as well. And I want to have maps that reward that. Um, and so, yeah, so getting this mix. That's definitely of, a, a skill set that I think goes missed a lot. To be fair, once In the Dark came out, it made that, you know, first, second play a little bit more obvious. So I think people started yeah. learning, you know, when to do that. But back in the old open days, going first or second on certain boards with whatever team you were doing definitely mattered a lot. So I do miss when people cared about that a little bit more. I think right now it's kind of only a medium skill because a lot of boards are kind of set to avoid having it be an issue. Yeah, which is which is a design space that kind of lost sort of like those little triangles on the butt base of the data cards that have like the shield and the swords and stuff on them those are for oh. narrative those are yeah. like explicitly for narrative oh, thank really? goodness okay. those don't actually do anything because there was one small period of time when the novitiates were told that uh they actually got faith points based on those and that has <laughs> gone away because yeah i don't think anybody wanted that no. yeah that's definitely those definitely kind of a tie over from the 2018 kill team yeah, so the and so like that's definitely something I just say to people that are like trying to make beta decimal work. Don't use the the GW sets. Poke around, just throw something together that actually looks like it would be like a working industrial installation where the walkways connect and they're they're interconnecting in different points. Um kind of have it so that there's you don't have to have a huge amount of advantage on one side, but you should have some difference on each side. And different teams are going to like different sides of the board, depending on what they're playing. Um, the like the visibility changes made a big difference there, um, just as far as staying safe. But you still got to make sure that like, you got to have good cover for deployment, like in any board. I, as much as I play like the premier Alpha Strike team in hero tech being able to set up so one player can't just like immediately blow the other off the board is really important to me um to just to get, get, to make it more of a game because like a couple of the games that i have played where i'm like oh i'm against blooded and they didn't see this big flying move going or i'm playing against chaos calls i'm playing and i i kill like five or six models in one blast and like it's not fun to go into turning point like the the fourth activation of turning point one with your opponent already just like i'm losing this game um yeah we switched I mean, okay. over to kill team from 40k because the alpha strike was gross and bad yeah well and, and armada didn't have alpha strikes originally and then they like right before the game kind of started it, that game kind of died through covid um more or less but I know there's some still, still some holdouts, but like they'd added like a super laser ship that could shoot your opponent in their deployment zone, which was not in the game otherwise. And it was like the absolute apocalypse. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't, but a lot of people acted like it was. But so, yeah, so good, like getting that alpha strike. But I think that it, it's important, like in a game like Kill Team, that if you're going to have like that kind of distance and range that the terrain counters, and I think Kill Team actually did a great job in their, in their design space of how like commands and obscuring and terrain works, as as much as obscuring is everyone's like favorite pet peeve in Kill Team, I think that's all in a in a pretty solid space. As much as everyone complains about it, the visibility rules do provide both an easy onboarding and plenty of space for your for like people to get better at it without it being too crazy but it does there's definitely a learning curve and that learning curve is not to be underestimated i think oftentimes when i teach people the game i just say obscuring is not necessary right now because it doesn't help you have any more fun but it would be boring if there was no layer in between visibility and cover yeah i uh i've i mean i've actually started getting in regular casual games now i 
probably put in like eight or nine learning games this year or something like that. And I, and I'll be like, there's this thing called obscuring, and I'm not teaching about it to you today because you're already absorbing a very complex game, um, and we don't need to hurt hurt your brain anymore. There, there's enough steps. Like if they've if there's someone that I I know is an experienced war gamer, I might throw it at them. Um, but yeah, like I feel like the most most people I talk to when they're where they're teaching a new player is like, what don't you do? Equipment, tac ops, obscuring. Everything else is usually fair game. And like as the captain of angles, which I've uh, coined to myself apparently. <laughs> yeah, I mean obscuring is it is like a fun mechanic. I'm a little bit torn on it because I'm like it, it doesn't need to be as crazy as it is. Um, but I absolutely have like fallen in love with abusing it terribly. And and like it could be toned down. I think it's kind of in the same spot that uh, damage on the stack was in Magic the Gathering for a long time, where there's this like very niche situation that is definitely in the rules, but it has unintended consequences. And we've learned what those unintended consequences are. And now we work around them and use them to our advantage. But it doesn't ever feel like you're telling your opponent the truth when they're first learning it. Like it is oh, by the book. Yeah. It is by the rules. But it never feels like fair. So because obscuring is so binary as a mechanic, most players just kind of like, meh, I, whatever, like, you, you're, my opponent says that you can't do it. And I've definitely heard from some people who have learned Kill Team that there's a lot of line of sight kind of like rule shenanigan or chicanery that's going on, which is not true. That's just how the rules work. But it definitely feels a little bit gross for a newer player who's just like, oh, I just want to like roll dice with friends. And then you bust out the laser line, you catch that you're in cover, and you're like, well, can't shoot me because my Space Marine's toe is behind this little nub of Octarius cover. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's them's the breaks, kids. But it never actually has to feel, it never actually feels like yeah. you're doing the right thing when your opponent is and, learning this for the first time in real time. And honestly, even at like the absolute highest level of competitive it's full blown fair game to just ruin somebody's day with the highest level of obscuring shenanigans. Cause like there's absolutely nobody that's safe from this. It's yeah. You know. and there's like, and like, this is just how the game works at a very, very high level. And unfortunately it is, you know, that's just the breaks. This is the rules of the game. And, and, and unfortunately every, that's just how the game works. And every game has that. Like you're not going to have a game that doesn't have, you know, like you get, your leaf blower 40k lists you get your last first activations um like that's hey, what just... armada had armada didn't have a dice roll for initiative you you would not include stuff in your list to reduce your list's points value and whoever had that better got to choose first or second so you could choose like i'm going to be first player and i'm going to be first player every turning point and then i'm going to have so imagine if vetgar just got to be first player every turning point no matter what they did with the activation advantage they have be pretty impressive it, it and, and people just absolutely abused the daylights out of it it was it, it, it was it's like all right i'm gonna set up so turning point or like turn two i'm just gonna like annihilate half your fleet there's nothing you can do about it um yeah so it every system has something like that um and that's and that's the thing for that. The the thing that I want actually in Kill Team most, as far as the, all the visibility stuff is, could we play, please have like model volume or like visibility doesn't include like the tip of the flowing cape or like the top of your banner. I, I know it's vi it, it is devastatingly heartbreaking when your banner gets shot. You don't need to like have a whole heart attack and die about it, Mister Mister Chaos Marine. Standard bear, or you know, you know, the physicality of your models is part of the part of the game. Like I know when Chaos Cults first came out, people were like, "Well, can I fit under this Octarius because it would make sense for me to?" And we're like, "No, you sure can't, because your icon yeah. bear is just too tall." Right. And I am kind of of two minds. I think it is kind of like silly, but it also does help players kind of get into that immersive space for your minis when you have to like, all right, can I actually see your model? And you're like. You sure can. You see, like, yeah. a little bit of a cave swinging out but, the edge, or, like, but, your dude's hand has spun off the edge. Like, I my, think it's kind of cute, but it is my, very cheesy in tournament play. My flying tentacle squid man can't turn his staff sideways to fly under there. Sure can. Look, if you've got an icon, you've got to let it rip, you know? Like, you can't hide <laughs> it from your own people, because they'll all fall yeah. apart and run away. you got to show it to the people, and you can't, like, hide under a building, you know? you got, you got to just, like... 
inspire him. Stand out in the open. Yeah, that Technomancer is on Don't a big a coward. flying spider because yeah. he wants to be seen. He can't just hide wherever he wants. Right? He's going to inspire the goons. Yeah, I think those sorts of things, like, while I do understand where people want to come from, from, like, I want it to be more, like, more competitive. I'm like, it's pretty competitive already. And sometimes those silly things That's can be fun. Pet it's pet just pet silly. Pet hmm? That's my one pet peeve is, like, yeah, like, maybe it was, like, yeah, there's other systems that do some do, do things a little differently. I'll live. And I, the, the cover concealment system kind of covers for that. And I think that was actually really ingenious on the design part. Like, oh, uh, if you don't want your guy with his big banner flapping all over the place getting shot, put him on conceal and heavy cover. Yeah, you have extra levers in this game. Like visibility yeah. is visibility. So obviously as a Psychomancer player, you get a lot of use out of just visibility. As a Pathfinder yeah. player, I got a use out of, I got a lot of use out of just visibility. Yeah. But, you know, for your opponents uh, from your opponent's perspective, that does mean that there is counterplay. While it might be a little bit harder to do, at least on Octarius boards, it is way easier to get no visibility for a couple key models. Yeah. It's not uh Oh, what did Pathfinders come out on? Chalnath. Chalnath, yeah. Chalnath is a visibility, like, super dream, but a, a team with zero ability to ignore obscuring, it's also a, a horrible, horrible place for me. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the Midwest scene. Are there any... So it sounds like you two are out of different stores. Is there any other yep. growth that you've seen, or what other big events are coming up? Do you have any of your own tournaments that are separate from Jason's tournaments coming up soon? My last one was the second Paul Bon York World Championship Invitational. And that was a store invitational? No, it was a store open tournament that Paul Bon York doesn't know what they, the names mean, so he just gives them more names and he forgot where the invitation list was. <laughs> All right. A goofy tournament where yeah, Gretchen was, were allowed. It's just a casual tournament with a stupid oversized name. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, anything so, coming up in the near well, future? The, so the the... The Dreamers Vaults in general are kind of trying to put on more kill team tournaments for us. So Dreamers Vault Champlain has one on the 29th, I believe, 27th of uh, of April here. And so we're kind of getting in a rotation that like quarterly at each of the, the Dreamers Vaults that are really interested in it are, are putting on events for us. Um, and then Jason, are you running Renegade next up? Oh, uh, actually, I'm not sure because I have recently figured out, well, like in the, the last week and a half that I am actually available that weekend. Um, <coughs> maybe it's not like 100 percent, but it looks decent. So um, I might just like swoop in and T.O. it because that's what I do a lot. Um, we'll see. OK, yeah, because that's in late May. Yeah, it's like May 18th and 19th. Uh, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm always in like the planning chats and stuff like that. And um, even the stuff that I'm not sure I can run, um, I've rec I've enlisted people to help out. Um, so so Will has helped out with a lot of the planning stuff. Like if I'm yeah. if just going to ghost mode for being super busy. Um, and, and Lee's jumped in for a lot of the narrative stuff, which is super sick. Yeah, those guys are having a lot of fun with their narrative. I've actually... the. Um, the poor hammer cast had a has their like Warhammer 40k horde mode, and I've been definitely thinking of like a kill team horde mode because I think that'd be super fun to be like, all right, we gotta go like save democracy by blowing up the Tyranid spawning points, um, and just have like a map where there's a bunch of gaunts that keep coming out. Uh, Hive Fleet. I haven't talked about this, but when I'm doing you know my 85 demo games a year, I run Hive Fleet with just a bunch of gaunts and a couple warriors. Because you're like, all right, here's your new player, here's your intercessors, and here are a bunch here are a bunch of bugs that if you look at in any way, they're just going to immediately die. So you know, like nothing feels quite as good as the new player as just being like, oh, I'm gonna get my spaceman, my Jimmy Space's specialist space boys, and I'm just gonna start absolutely annihilating these dinosaur bugs from outer space. Yeah, that makes sense. Sounds like um, a fun time for all involved. Yeah, uh, you know, for my part, we'll have the Atlantic City Open coming up on June 16, 17, and I'll be running that one. Uh, we'll have uh, the WTC terrain and some custom play mats, courtesy of uh, FLG. Oh, June 14 to 16. So if anybody wants to come to that and have a good time in Atlantic City, you know, get some gambling on, get some games in. We'll have a silver, we'll have a silver golden ticket, you know, make sure uh, you can go to Worlds. So actually, on that note, with the WTC train, is that previewed? Can we do we have a, like a link to that to show it off? 
we can't preview that, but we will have a product review in the near future on our YouTube channel. It's pretty sick. Honestly, the review is going to be really good. Spoiler alert. Yeah, and we'll have our own custom copy of Just Another Kill Team podcast WTC style terrain with our logos on it and everything. So maybe we'll give those out to players or maybe uh, an enterprising uh, Patreon listener will be able to get that set after we do the review. Need to get on the Patreon apparently. Speaking of which, all right, all Ted, all thanks. listeners should get on the Patreon and the Discord <laughs> and should leave five star reviews on whatever platform you're listening on. Especially YouTube, if you're on our YouTube. Yes. Here's for the YouTube reviews. Like, subscribe, uh, click the bell. That's what YouTubers say. Ted, thank you for coming on, talking about the last prong of the higher tech circle that people do not talk about, the Psychomancer. Yeah, it was a, it was a good time. I, uh, I'm always happy to sit and wax philosophical about you know, traumatizing my opponents. For fun and profit, of course. For fun and profit. So.